Joshua, continuing our study in Genesis chapter 3. I think this is the eighth or ninth message. Um, probably another hundred or so to go. <laughs> there's that, it is that deep. Uh, it's amazing. I initially, when we shared, I shared some of this at our Tracy Bible study, I spent, I, I calculated about a hundred hours of study into just this chapter, and, and as I've spent more and more time into it, it's, um, uh, it's continues to expand. Uh, if you'd like to follow along uh, this morning, uh, let's look at beginning at verse 9, and we will read to verse 15. Genesis chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Before we come to this great topic that grace reigns over sin in the garden, I'd like to spend just a few minutes by way of review because there is a, a cascading of truth or linking um, as we progress through Genesis chapter 3. Last time we looked at this idea that What's going to open up for us here is really a something of a, of a courtroom scene. We have the summons has gone out to Adam and the woman. We have the defendants, the judge, the evidence that's going to be examined. We have the sentences that are going to be pronounced. And it's a trial for the ages in the sense that time and history and, and mankind standing before God is going to be somehow related to what has happened here in the garden and everything that fell out because of sin. And we looked at one idea which I think was very surprising and shocking when we asked the question, who's the defendant here? And of course, the woman and, the, and Adam and the serpent are defendants, but God himself was also seen as a defendant. God was on trial as mankind tried to blame their sin upon God. And there were several arguments that were put forward by Adam and the woman, directly and indirectly blaming God. And as it is today, we looked at even in our culture. And whether you think about science, whether you think about a constantly changing culture, um, the current societal norms, God is on trial every day. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, he's not only on trial, God has been found guilty because God is blamed for many, many things. When bad things happen to good people, uh, when humans cannot discern spiritual truth as to what God might be saying or what God is doing, uh, when man thinks he can manage things better, than God, when blame shifting happens. On one hand, God is omnipotent and sovereign. On the other hand, he's benevolent and good and gracious. And yet man thinks these two are mutually exclusive because if God was all-powerful and sovereign, he would never ever let anything bad happen or an affliction or a sickness. They cannot reconcile the two. And, not surprisingly, we looked at some biblical examples. Mm 
of eminent saints who put God on trial. Gideon, Abraham and Sarah, the Israelites in the wilderness, complaining, murmuring, the psalmist, New Testament disciples. And of course the trial continues downstream. And lastly, as we think about this review, I, I quoted Proverbs 19 and verse 3, which just seems to really capsulize it all. The foolishness of man perverts his own way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. He perverts his own way, and then he frets against the Lord. Well, now as we move into the message today, I want to, to say that we cannot overvalue, that's, that's probably the wrong word, but we cannot overvalue the absolute ruin that sin brought in to the world. The, the, the pall of death and darkness that sin ushered in to the world. And, and this moment when Adam and the woman are, are in a transgression and, and before God comes, it, it's absolutely terrible. It's really, really bad. I, I was thinking about that, that statement by the Apostle Paul in Acts 27 when, when he was on that, that voyage that was doomed and he said, we gave up all hope that we might be saved. And I think that's the framework that Adam and the woman found themselves in. All hope. This is what sin does. Sin kills hope. Sin kills love. Sin kills many, many things. We cannot overestimate or, or really understand the absolute ruin and bad negative significance of sin. And as we move into this trial, what I wanted to do today was just as a backdrop, I wanted to just take a few steps back and, and understand a little bit about God's grace as it's going to come into this account. I'm not going to look at in, in detail. We're not going to get into the actual trial today. But just as, as a backdrop or a foundation, I want to just, just see how grace begins to infiltrate on so many different avenues. When I was a Christian, when I, when I first became a Christian, I thought God's grace after he saved me, I thought it was, was like, a, like a shooting gallery. Have you ever been, ever been to a shooting gallery where targets pop up and then they disappear? And then another one pops up and it disappears. And I would go through my early Christian life and, and one week there was this influx of grace somehow. And then I would go another few days or a week or a month, this other great impact of grace. What I came to find out was grace was more like this, this process, this, this river that I was immersed in. Sometimes it would seem to go fast, sometimes slow. But God never left me. His grace was enveloping me. And he had this entire process and will for me. Well, first of all, we really have to, again, remind ourselves of, of something of sin before we move into the six aspects of grace. Some of this is by way of review, but we need to remind ourselves of the, the absolute negative impact of sin. We looked at initially sin from the standpoint of mankind and not from the standpoint of God. Sin from the standpoint of mankind, man understood some immediate consequences of sin. He immediately knew fear which he had never known before. He knew he was at enmity with God. He, he succumbed to this irrational religious pragmatism, thinking he could, he could do something to escape God's certain, certain judgment. And then he blame shifted, and he tried to justify himself a little bit. But from God's vantage point, sin is infinitely worse than we can understand, Amen. infinitely worse than we can imagine. God said it this way, the wages of sin is death. Sin is totally antithetical to the nature of God. God is, 
is thrice holy. He's pure. He's righteous. He's separate from sin. Separate from sinners apart from the grace of God. Sin made this intrusion into the universe and it brought death, disunity, disharmony. It permeated the world. Mankind became affected ethically, socially, physically, mentally, intellectually, in every possible way. Again, God's Word says that in Adam, all die. As soon as we're born, we begin a long death march, the death process. And it's only in God's grace to mankind that, that there can be this restoration, this restitution, this, this recovery of mankind. Sin, of course, did not originate in the garden. Sin originated in that, that spirit or that angelic world when, when Satan, the devil, apostatized from God and, and took with himself that cohort of, of angels. Through his pride, his self-will, he fell. Sin is bad. Sin is very bad. We quoted that confession of faith definition. Sin is any transgression of or lack of conformity to the moral law of God. In disposition, thought, act, or state of being. The Bible in the book of James gives us this, this process of sin I'm sure you're familiar with. When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Sin originates in the heart and the self-will of fallen man. In the heart. If you were in attendance at Pastor Joe's Wednesday Bible study, he talked about outward sins a little bit, but then he focused in on the fact that it's a heart issue and God looks at the heart and it germinates in and it, it comes out of the heart. And even things that people may not see, outward sins, that inward malice, inward hate, <coughs> inward unrighteousness, is sin. The heart is desperately wicked yeah. and deceitful above all else who can know it. And the next verse, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. That's what God's interested in, in the heart. Man sins with the consent of his own will. These stages, I think you can see in the garden. When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That desire, that appetite to go away that's not God's way, to give in to these evil indulgences, the woman saw the tree, and she put it in the context of how the enemy described it to her. And she put it in the context of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I suggested to you, I think there was a time period, I, I don't know how long, but as she thought about it, she didn't immediately grab it, she thought about it. And it probably took on even a newer form in her mind. And then the will yields to desire. She actually took that fruit. And then sin is born as she ate it. And then it brought forth death. Again, only God's grace can resolve the issue to the satisfaction and the glory of God. We previously also had quoted Pastor Downing's Baptist Confession when he said sin possesses five realities. Guilt, penalty, pollution, power, and presence. And the gospel of salvation in that, justification deals with the guilt and the penalty, and sanctification deals with the pollution and the power, and glorification will deal with the absolute presence of sin in the life of the believer. 
we cannot really un we cannot estimate the very, very bad nature of sin. It destroys, it harms, it disfigures, it hurts, it kills. As I said, it kills hope. It kills peace. It kills the soul. The consequences in Genesis chapter 3, separation from God, this doctrine of total depravity where man in his totality has been infected, God is going to pronounce these, these curses, not upon Adam, not upon the woman, but now we have pain, we have sorrow, thorns and thistles, being expelled from the garden. Uh, an enemy is exposed for being very strong, whose, whose desire is, is to, to, to separate man from fellowship with God and, and other things. And when Adam and the woman died, that sin was imputed to all of their posterity. And they had this substantial cataclysmic change in their relationship to God. Again, we cannot overvalue this, this pall of death, the destruction, the death that sin brought in. It's really, really bad. But having said that, as we carefully read Genesis chapter 3, we see the, now the influences of God's grace coming in on several fronts. And where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Amen. And I want to look at just a few of these, these aspects of grace as it comes in here at the very outset before later in subsequent messages we actually get into the trial. We get into uh, the, the seed um, and tying that in with the tree of life and all these other things. So let me just say simply this about grace. We understand grace is that principle of unmerited or demerited favor. We understand grace, the personification of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ, hence that acrostic of God's riches at Christ's expense. We understand grace is this power or this divine enablement in the salvation and experience of the believer. We understand it's a prerogative, it's sovereign, it's divine grace, it's, it's free grace. And we understand that for the believer, it's, it's somewhat of, of an all-encompassing process or lifestyle, for lack of a better word, in which God has put us into, and, and we're really surrounded, whether we are aware of it or not, we're surrounded by the grace of God. Well, confining ourselves to, to a few ideas here in Genesis chapter 3, first of all from your outline, grace reveals. Grace reveals. What is it that grace reveals? Grace reveals itself for what it really is. It reveals itself that it has to be divine, rich. It, it's the very nature of God in the sense that it, it's an expression of love and forgiveness. Think, think about this. Grace is the movement of God toward Adam and the woman. It's the movement of God that reveals God's thoughts, his intents, along with the sovereign power to bring about his goodness towards man. As God begins to move towards man, he's revealing what his intentions are for Adam and the woman. They begin to see God in a new light relative to this grace in which they are going to be able to stand. God's Grace reveals itself in very tangible way. Let me give you one other Old Testament example before we look at Adam and the woman, and I think it will explain it. Do you remember that account when Moses asked the Lord? He said, how will it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? 
Is it not, if thou goest with us? Moses understood that for the people to know, for him to know, and for the nations around them to know that they found grace in God's sight, there would be something very tangible that would happen. God would go with them. And they could have that assurance. They, they, could, they could experience this grace. There's this tangible aspect as God begins to move towards his people in such a way that his intentions, his power, his thoughts towards his people begins to be known. Before the fall, Adam and the woman in the garden, everything they knew about God was, we'll say, positive. It was based on this, this harmony that existed, this fellowship, this tremendous love, this communion with him. And then sin enters the world, and now their thoughts of God, and not that God is just mildly upset with us. Certainly God is, 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 is disappointed with us, but he's, he's angry. There's enmity. We're going to run away from God because we don't know God from the standpoint of now we're in sin. A very uncertain environment that they find themselves in, but they know they are at odds with God. And as Genesis 3 opens up, they now understand that God is going to be very gracious to them. God is not going to curse them. God is going to start putting and revealing to them the, these pieces of the gospel that will in fact make a way for them. They, they had not known God from this standpoint before. It's almost as before the fall they did not need grace. It's almost as though they did not understand grace. And now, from this new vantage point of being sinners, at enmity with God, and God takes the initiative, God calls them, they hear his voice, he begins to, throughout this passage, we did not read uh, all of this as, as everything opens up. But they're beginning to understand the movement of God towards them, what his intentions are. And they have this, this vantage point, this understanding of this, this tremendous God. They understand that God is going to cover their shame and provide salvation. God is going to defeat their enemy. God's goodness will lead them to repentance. God is going to give them promises. Though they have to bear the effects of the curse, God does not curse them. This is what grace does. As grace reveals itself, it reveals itself for what it really is. It's, it's the goodness of God. It's the movement of God. It's the power of God the riches of God, his divine help to lost sinners. It's unmerited love, unearned love, unworked for love. This movement of God. Grace reveals itself for what it really is. Is not this the way it was with, with Saul? Saul, who, who would become Paul, where Saul is, is knocked off that horse, God comes to him and Saul realizes that his relationship to God is not based on his works, his lineage as a Jew, his self-righteousness, his deeds of the body, religious ceremonialism. Nothing man-centered but divine grace. Grace reveals itself for what it is. So multifaceted, so rich. So deep. Ian Murray says that grace revealed itself to the surprise of Adam and the woman. He says they were surprised. They had not known God in this way. They did not understand that God, they knew he, had, he was just. They did not know he was the justifier. 
of those that come to Him by faith. Is grace any less marveled at by the believer today? If it is, then your Christian experience is not what it should be because Paul says you should grow in grace mm -hmm. and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. There should be these everyday revelations of what God's grace is doing. It's not a shooting gallery that pops up something here and something there as we go through life. It, it envelopes the believer. And we walk in grace every day. And we need to have spiritual eyes in our experience to see God's grace, His movement towards you individually, to reveal His plan for you, the fellowship that He wants to have with you, how He's going to use you, what He's going to do in your life, how He's going to get glory out of your life. God's grace in the garden reveals itself for what it really is. It's amazing grace. Every day. Next, grace breaks. Grace breaks. What is it that grace breaks in the garden? Notice verse 13. God asks her, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Grace has broken the allegiance that she had formed with the serpent. And she and Adam now see sin for what it really is. They now see the serpent for who he really is. He's a beguiler. He was no friend of God. He's no friend of Adam and the woman's. He's a beguiler. He brought in enmity with God. He made us an enemy of God through sin. And there is this now, I, be, I believe, this beginning of a return to the friendship with God. She's able to understand that God's divine grace broke that, that affinity with, or that allegiance that she had formed with him and with sin. This expression in the Hebrew indicates that this woman is no longer, no longer one with the serpent, but she is taking a step away from him. She's sensible that it was not friendship, it was not, he was not out for her good, for her betterment. He wanted to destroy her. He wanted to destroy God's work. He's subtle. She understands he's crafty, that he's a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar from the beginning. He beguiled me. Yes, I did sin. She's going to own, at least to some degree, but she's gonna, there's going to be this, this grace is going to break this relationship that she had. In verse 15, there's going to be this ongoing aspect of this enmity here that's going to be affirmed, not only to the woman, but to her seed. Her seed is also going to be at enmity with, with the devil. Her seed is also going to be at enmity now with, with the sin and the lust. Um, of this. And of course, this, just going from the, from the general to the particular, it's interesting that as we're thinking about Christ, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's the seed of the woman that is here marked out that is going to do that work. Satan would use the weaker vessel to gain entrance into the world. God would use the, something through the weaker vessel to bring about victory. The seed of the woman is going to bruise his head. Grace breaks that bond between the believer and sin. Of course, we have to ask the question, has, has that bond been broken in your life to the point where you see there's a break? There's now this, this gulf of demarcation. We're not talking about sinless perfection, but we're talking about an attitude and a heart and a lifestyle that now understands 
where we are, where we should be relative to sin, relative to temptation, understanding this is the birth of spiritual warfare, that the warfare is going to go on, there's going to be this enmity, but we're on God's side. We're on, not on that side. It could be a, something as simple as friendship with the world. Paul said in Ephesians, in time past, you walked according to the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But now it's been broken. Before that, the devil wanted to separate you from God, break fellowship, use his craftiness, his subtlety. Now we can say we're not ignorant of his schemes. Grace breaks that bond. Next, grace promises. Verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Grace promises a savior. Grace promises a redeemer. We understand the seed of the woman is pointing to Christ. God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, he will save his people from their sins. The section has been called the Proto-Evangelium, that is the first, the prototype, the first declar clear declaration of the gospel of grace. As this trial is going to be played out, we're going to see the gospel in all of its fullness declared. And of course, it starts off with a curse. Mm -hmm. A curse. A curse upon the great adversary of mankind. A curse upon evil. A curse upon sin and, and wickedness and death and hell. A curse upon our curse. Again, no curse is pronounced upon Adam and the woman. But the gospel, when we think about the gospel, we have to include the curse. Sin has brought in terrible consequences. And our declaration of the gospel cannot be something that is so painless or, 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 or neutral or, or pleasant that we don't understand the, the depth of what the scripture says. As a matter of fact, the very first thing Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do when he comes, he is going to reprove the world of sin. That, that element where we understand sin and the curse and what has happened. When he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove this, the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they did not believe on me. Adam and the woman did not believe God and his word, as simple as it was. This is grace. In the midst of this very dark day, he promises a redeemer. He promises a savior. By the woman had sin entered into the world, Adam as the federal head. By woman and the second Adam would the curse be dealt with. And God would be victorious over this double bruising that, that we understand. Of course, we live on this side of the cross. And, and we have the, the, the absolute spiritual benefit of understanding that it has come to pass. The head of the serpent has been given this, this death knell, this, this death blow. And so... Because he was wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquity, we understand what Christ has done. Grace promises a Redeemer. It promises a Savior. And as you know, God cannot lie. Amen. Next, again, as we're just trying to understand how grace, the aspects of grace are now starting to come in from several different vantage points simultaneously. Next, grace removes. Grace removes. This is going to be linked to our ne next aspect of grace. But believe it or not, grace can be seen 
in the fact that man was expelled from the garden. Let me give you two thoughts. The first one is simply this. Although grace removed man from the garden, man was not removed from Eden. Adam and Eve will shortly be expelled from the garden, verse 23, which we did not read. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he, that is God, drove out the man. They were removed from the garden, but they were not removed from Eden. Let me, let me borrow a few words. I know sometimes it's tedious to hear a quote, but, but uh, this is so wonderful from Horatius Bonar when he talks about this, saying that man was expelled from paradise, but not from the garden. Man's expulsion is not to be viewed as is normally done, being removed from a happy dwelling, his own special home, as though that were the punishment. Rather, he is removed from the presence of God. Paradise was not so much Adam's dwelling place as it was Jehovah God's. And although man is removed from the garden, he is left within sight of it. He's allowed to remain in Eden. He's not driven out into some desert. He's not driven out far away as though there was nothing but wrath waiting for him. God shows favor or grace in spite of his sin. God is not canceling out the pardon he is promising. He's not going to intimate now that God is beginning to frown and change his idea. Man is left in Eden. He's not put in the outer darkness. He's not put in the full sunshine either, but he's put in this kind of twilight. So he can have this hope set before him. He kept the garden that Adam and the woman and subsequent progeny could see as a specimen of God's handiwork, reminding man of what was lost, giving hints to man of where God was, in what environment God was, still in that pristine environment as far as God. He's telling man that he did not entirely leave man to his own. When you read Gen uh, Genesis chapter 4, you understand, yes, there's Adam and the woman living in Eden. How close to the garden, we do not know. But he could visually see it. He could use that as, as the hope set before him to understand that God had not left the earth, that garden would not be destroyed until the, the flood, but it was there in those initial days, those initial years. God was, there's this element of grace. Even though man was removed, he had to be removed, right? But he was not removed entirely so far away that he could not, not think God's thoughts after him or, or strive internally and spiritually to get there. So it is with us. We're in sight of heaven. We can see paradise. We understand it to, to some degree. And the more we look at it, the more desires we have the more longings we have. There is an element of grace in the fact that God removed man from the garden, keeping him in Eden. And of course, the second part of this is, and we've mentioned this before, God had to remove man because it says in verse 22, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and live forever, he had to put him out. It would have been unspeakably awful for sinful man to live forever in that sinful state. And so God graciously removed us. Next, grace conforms. Grace conforms. Grace conforms. 
is conforming us, it has turned us into this world so we can undergo this refining process, being conformed, fitted to come back to that garden. Living in a fallen world is not a punishment. Living in the world is, is not a curse, though we bear the effects of a fallen world and the curse. This is now the process that God has divinely chosen. He wants us to be a stranger now and a pilgrim in this place so he can conform us into the image of his son, so that he can outfit us to get us back to that place. Man was, God said in, in Genesis chapter 1, man, God says, without any timetable, let us make man in our image and our likeness. There's no timetable given there, but let us make man in our image and our likeness. And in verse 27, God says that he made man in the image of God, in the image of God, he made him. But man wasn't made in the likeness of God. Man was in the image of God, but he wasn't like God, at least when mankind fell. That's not like God. Man is created in the likeness of God when he becomes born again. And as he's undergoing this process, being conformed different, uh, to the image of God, different Greek word than the, the, the Hebrew idea, but this whole process that we're undergoing, we always look at it in a very negative way. Well, why do we have to do this? Why do I have to endure pain and affliction and suffering? And, and everything is just, everywhere I go, there's these roadblocks. And God is making a way. God is doing a work to get us back to the garden. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Because the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Grace has not left us alone out in the world. Grace is making us a stranger and a pilgrim to this place. And at the same time, it's making us a citizen of heaven. That's what God's doing. Last, grace preserves. Grace preserves. I'm not going to talk about the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Um, grace in itself is a topic that we could spend many weeks on. But grace preserves. What is it that God is preserving? Well, notice that God curses the ground. And we understand that sin has infected the creation. The entire creation was made subject to vanity. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Creation was cursed. The ground was cursed. But God preserved the habitat of the garden. Principally, God preserved the tree of life. The tree of life God preserved from this corruption that infected the world. The tree of life did not lose its sustaining virtue just because because man did something. The tree of life was not uprooted. It stayed in the center of paradise and it was protected. And although, although now death is the way to life, there was a way. God, God preserved the privilege of taking from the tree of life, withholding it only for a season. It wasn't, not, it wasn't finally and totally removed. It was waiting for a righteousness that should be brought in that would remove that flaming sword that the cherubim had that was guarding the way to the tree of life. Once a righteousness could come in, then the way to the tree of life could be opened up again. Right now, in this context, the, the tree of life was unapproachable. Unapproachable as long as man had been in this body of sin, 
this body of death would try to get there. But now we understand that it's through death. Spiritually, death of self. Physical death. That it's through that channel that we get to eternal life. And this tree of life that I think is very symbolic but referring to Christ, we'll see. Two times in the book of Revelation we read about this tree of life. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Mm. Later on, at the very end of this book, blessed are all they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. God has preserved the tree of life. He has preserved his habitat Remember when sin first came into this, this universe, God kicked out Satan and those fallen angels from that heavenly realm. And then mankind had to be kicked out. And God is showing us that he is preserving a habitation, a holy habitation, the tree of life, being able to partake of Christ. Once there has been made a way that we can do that, in such a way that we will live forever, not in a sinful state, but surprisingly enough, as, as the people of God. Genesis chapter 3 is, is really a dividing point in the scripture, as we've said, where everything after the fall, we see the restitution, the restoration, the recovery of mankind according to God's grace. And though it's really a dark day when mankind fell, a very bad day, yet we see that grace is already working mm -hmm. to reveal, revealing itself. Grace exists. What if grace didn't exist? Grace reveals itself for what it really is, the movement of God, his intentions, his thoughts, his working in the life of the believer, mm -hmm. not in some abstract way or only to Adam and the woman, but to you individually today. Grace breaks that bond that man had forged with this unholy alliance with the serpent. That's right, he's a beguiler. He's an enemy of God. He's no friend of mine. Grace <coughs> promises. It promises a redeemer, a savior who will do the work. Grace removes us from the garden. It's very, it's hard to say, isn't it? It's hard to think about. Couldn't we have just stayed in the garden? But God removes us. And there is grace involved with that. God is conforming us so that we can come back someday to never leave. And grace has preserved that holy habitation where we are heading. A dark day in Genesis chapter 3, but a very gracious day. A very gracious day as God begins to reveal his plan of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the blessed hope that is set before us. Father, we pray today especially that this whole idea of grace, that not only would we not take it for granted or simply pigeonhole it in our salvation. By grace we are saved mm -hmm. through faith. But that we might see your grace every day in our life. And that we might magnify and, and give thanks and adore you for what it is really doing in our life. Though we walk by faith and not by sight, we pray that our experience would be rich as we understand you working in our life. We thank you for this assembly. We trust that our worship has been acceptable in thy sight through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.